Hello, and welcome back to today's episode of the Wallfacer Labs podcast. Today's guest is Wesley Pryor, the founder of Asheron Trading, a digital asset market maker. Wesley, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ryan. Happy to be here. So let's jump right in. So the role of a market maker in crypto today uh, is on some level, I think, very easy to understand but is often painted as this mysterious kind of shadowy figure in the market. How do you describe the role that your firm plays and that market makers play uh, in crypto more generally? Yeah, I think, you know, the role of a market maker is, you know, really simple to understand from the context of the end user. So if you log into an exchange like Binance.com, Coinbase.com, um, you're going to actually see directly see the order book. And um, typically, market makers are the ones serving up those orders on both the buy and the sell side. And so if you do, you know, place a market order that gets executed, typically you're trading against a market maker. And the more competitive the, um, you know, the landscape is for market makers in that particular asset, the better execution that you're going to get. So um, when you buy a, a token at, and it's listed at a dollar, and, you know, you actually, um, you know, get that execution. Um, that's because the market was very efficient. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, well, I, you know, I guess on that, though, there's definitely a lot of difference, I think, at least, of the role of a market maker in crypto versus the role of a market maker in traditional markets. So I don't come from traditional markets, but, you know, I've done a bit of research and you can correct me here if I'm wrong, but... In traditional markets, the role seems to be very commoditized, you could say, right? There is, you know, if you go to the New York Stock Exchange, there's a set number of market makers that uh, work with the exchange and that may trade a new listing and kind of ultimately become a DMM or something. Um, could you break down a little bit more the difference in the role between a market maker on, say, the New York Stock Exchange and in crypto? Yeah, you know, I don't think, um, like at the core of it, I don't think it's really that different. Um, so if you look at a uh, traditional IPO, uh, traditional IP, someone, you know, someone has a company, they want to go public on, you know, the, the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, whatever it might be, uh, they're going to enlist an investment bank. Uh, the investment bank is going to, you know, price the asset and then allocate the shares, you know, to investors and so on. Part of that allocation is going to be uh, to market makers. And um, the what the investment bank, um, you know, and the the issuer will do is they will, you know, select the designated market maker that, you know, they want to work with and then communicate that with the exchange they're listing on. And what the exchange will do is, you know, either, you know, bless that, um, you know, by actually uh, appointing that market maker for uh, trading in that security or not. Um, but, you know, there, you know, th that process really involves coordination between, you know, the issuer, the investment bank that's, you know, brokering the deal. And then, of course, the exchange where the asset is going to be traded. And, you know, so in crypto, um, you know, these assets are going to market through, you know, what I would consider the crypto IPO equivalent. Now, the biggest difference I would say is that the exchanges don't really maintain a list of, um, you know, uh, market makers that, you know, they have a history of working with and, and really, um, you know, kind of and, and kind of bless the deal. The project will typically kind of come to the exchange and say, hey, this is the market maker that we have signed. And then the exchange will kind of decide if that's acceptable or not. Um, so that would be like a, a pretty big structural difference. But ultimately, it, it's very it's very similar in that you know there's a set of participants and they're kind of determining who's going to provide liquidity in the asset. I see. So I think that actually changes my understanding a bit. I was kind of under the impression that in traditional markets, the role of the, or I should say, the relationship between the exchange and the market maker was sort of the central or focal point. And that the relationship between the market maker and the company was less key. Whereas, I guess to your point, in crypto, that is not reversed, but a bit different in that the role between the market maker and the token is key. Whereas the exchange 
Maybe exchanges have their own market makers, but that's a less central piece in some sense. Yeah. So, um, I mean, like if you if you look at it like this, um, you know, with with the uh, there's there's so many different exchanges. You know, there's uh, hundreds of you know global digital asset exchanges, right? And they none of them really have like a uniform set of standards. Um, and so, you know, and, and these digital assets are kind of coming to market in a very rapid manner. So, you know, they're, they're not really, it's not like they have a, a set of, you know, three potential eligible market makers that they could choose from. And then, you know, really like one or two exchange destinations. Um, the, the offering is so much more broad and, and less uniform. Um, and, and typically there's no investment bank, you know, kind of advising them through the process of going public. It's like this fragmented um, disjoint of participants. So you've got like these token advisors who are all giving different views who may or may not have conflicts of interest. There's, um, you know, the exchange itself that they may be having a dialogue with and the exchange may say, hey, we'll come back to us once you have a market maker. Um, and, and not even like, you know, say, hey, like, here's a list of market makers that have done a good job on our platform that you may want to speak to. Um, and then there's also, um, you know, the, um, you know, their investors who, um, you know, investors can be a great resource, but at the same time, you know, they may not be really having their eye on the long term trajectory of the protocol itself. They may just be you know, concerned about, you know, the profitability of their investment over a shorter time horizon. Um, so um, this is where I think things really differ. Um, there's just not that, like, there's a lot of choices to be made. And there's not really like a uniform process or any single knowledgeable institution guiding the transaction. Yeah, I, I will say, you know, so I've, uh, been on the other side, I guess, twice now of trying to get tokens listed on exchanges. And mm -hmm. I will say in doing that in 2018 versus 2020 was two very different experiences. And 2018 was much more focused on like this long tail of generally Asian exchanges uh, that I think in hindsight did very little to grow the asset or adoption or anything. Whereas in 2020, trying to get a token listed, it was much more concentrated on you know, you want a U.S. exchange like Coinbase or Gemini, Kraken, you know, obviously everybody wants Binance. And then maybe there's a few others that, um, you know, kind of add a bit to the process. Do you find today that kind of that long tail of exchanges still can add a lot for a token or not so much? No, um, you know, a lot of the long tail exchanges are, um, well, let me actually take a step back. Long tail, long tail is best suited for decentralized exchanges. So if you're a long tail digital asset, you know, meaning you're, a, you're a nascent protocol and you're really going through like initial price discovery, maybe, um, you've got a really limited, um, budget, you know, to, um, you know, provide ample liquidity for the protocol to operate effectively and things of this nature. You really can't um, afford to be losing resources and allocating, you know, um, tokens or, you know, other treasury assets to these long tail exchanges. Um, they're, they're not going to add any value and they're really not best suited for what you need at the time. And I think something that's really important for any digital asset issuer is to think about, you know, their life cycle and where they are within that. And, um, <clears throat> you know, large exchanges can add significant value, um, you know, when you're entering, you know, a period of, um, you know, price discovery where um, you need a large inefficient venue to support the amount of volume that your asset is trading. So I think that's really something important to consider. Yeah, I, I certainly think that the just proliferation of DeFi has made so much of this easier in terms of certainly getting that initial traction, that initial liquidity, and then kind of, you could almost say graduating to a market maker over time once you start to look at centralized listings. 
Um, something else back to kind of the differences maybe with traditional versus crypto markets is, and, and you know, pardon me if this seems very rudimentary, but the actual process of how a market maker gets paid. Uh, in the traditional market example versus the crypto example, where are the differences? So again, in, in the crypto, or sorry, in the traditional market example, my understanding is that there's maybe programs they have with exchanges, different kind of rebates or obviously payment for order flow has become a thing with the retail brokerages over time. How does that possibly differ than how market maker gets paid in crypto? Yeah, so, um, so there's like two types of compensation, right? So there's compensation through exchanges and that can be in the form of rebates or other incentives. And, you know, that those type of programs exist in both crypto and in both, you know, traditional uh, financial exchanges, right? And now, but then there's another type of compensation. So if you're talking about, you know, an initial listing. So if an asset is, you know, let's talk about like Ethereum, that asset's already trading on every major exchange in the world. So if you're a market maker, you may hold Ethereum for a variety of reasons, right? And you may be allocating that inventory to different venues that have a high enough, you know, um, organic demand for the asset and then also favorable, you know, um, you know, make or rebates, if you will, that you can kind of profit and, and have a good return on that capital. Um, so, you know, that's one way of being compensated uh, by exchanges that you can kind of parallel to, um, you know, traditional, you know, markets. Now, what's, um, you know, what's a more challenging consideration, probably less known is, you know, how do you provide liquidity in a new issuance? So a crypto asset that's going through their IPO equivalent. And I mentioned previously, so, so essentially, if an asset has not gone through price discovery yet, um, you're talking about a new issuance. And therefore, a market maker needs to source inventory from somewhere. They can't source it from the market. Um, the exchange doesn't have it. It's directly from the issuer. So they need to be allocated that asset before the asset um, goes to market. Therefore, they have the inventory to provide liquidity when it when it goes public, right? And um, in traditional markets, um, like I mentioned, there's a lead investment bank that's kind of taking the transaction to market. They're going to be working with you know that issuer to allocate a certain amount of shares to the market maker who is going to provide liquidity um, you know once the asset goes public and you know they're taking risk by um, you know providing liquidity to a certain standard that's acceptable for you know um, you know these exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ um, so there's risk there but the but the compensation is coming in the form of being allocated shares um, you know at the IPO price right and now in crypto it's very similar except that allocation can come in multiple forms. So uh, the issuer may not ever actually make that allocation externally. Uh, they may elect to hire a market maker and retain um, all of those, all of the initial um, you know, tokens that they would allocate to liquidity within their treasury, but designate it to a market maker to provide liquidity on their behalf. And they may compensate that market maker in a simple service agreement. Um, you know, that would be that would be almost similar to a separately managed account if you were to look for a traditional finance equi equivalent, right? You've got a specific mandate, you've got certain assets, and you're allocating them to an asset manager to do something on your behalf. Now, alternatively, you may allocate, um, you know, that those assets via a loan and you may couple that loan with a series of call options meaning the market maker could either repay that loan in kind in the same amount of tokens that they receive you know with or without interest it depends or they may repay it by exercising uh, the call option and giving the issuer um, cash to settle the loan instead of the tokens back um, so these are different ways of allocating 
uh, liquidity that market makers need to be able to provide li- to or allocate inventory that market makers need to provide liquidity upon the initial primary listing. Understood. And I guess on the crypto piece, the sort of magic of that from the token side is making sure that the pricing of those options is appropriate slash favorable. Coming back to the traditional side, though, so those market makers are actually buying the shares at the IPO price, right? That is not a pro bono or loan type of structure. Is that correct? Is that- no, they're not. They're not uh, typically buying them. They're receiving an allocation mm-hmm. of the shares Got it. for providing the service of market making. Yep. So, um, you know, it, it, it's more akin to direct compensation for services rendered. I see. And sorry to kind of go into the details. Of this is mostly my curiosity. Okay, if you don't know these details here, but say on a five, you know, billion dollar IPO price listing, how much does a market maker typically receive in an allocation? Is it maybe 1% of the shares that will be floated or 2%, 5%, 10%? Um, I don't have, um, you know, I don't have those statistics available to me here. Um, you know, it would be something, it definitely be something interesting to look into. And, um, you know, one thing that, is you know helpful in terms of traditional markets is you can dig out a lot of information from public disclosures and that's something that is you know pretty much totally absent in crypto today yes it is yes it is uh so maybe one last question kind of on the role of the market maker here um so you have uh kind of opened my eyes a bit here i think i had the understanding that traditional markets, market makers was much more of a commoditized service. Uh, I think to the contrary, they're actually still very well compensated for their services and it's probably not as commoditized as it seemed. That said, I guess the role of the market maker in crypto versus traditional markets from your perspective is, I would assume, much more difficult, right? You probably have less hedging instruments available to you on some of these newer listings, much more of a structural and kind of infrastructure challenge. Where do you see the biggest differences in kind of the role that you play as a market maker in crypto versus if you were a market maker, say, in on the New York Stock Exchange? Uh, yeah, there's, um, you know, I think, you know, you know, traditional financial markets have a very clear framework. There's very clear rules to operate within. And then you have, you know, an investment bank that's really, you know, leading the transaction end to end. And so, you know, everything is very standardized. And, and orderly in terms of the process. And um, the other structural difference I would say that's a really big one is that traditionally when you're going through an IPO, you know, that company has been exist in existence for years before. You know, there's um, there's already, you know, there's less ambiguity in terms of the fair value for that asset once it goes public. Now, obviously, there may be, you know, an initial pop on the primary listing or, or what have you, but, um, you know, you're not, you're, you're not expecting the asset to open on public markets and immediately trade 10x, right, or, or 100x or, you know, the type of things that you see in crypto. And really, the, the key difference is that, um, you know, crypto, uh, the crypto IPO equivalent isn't like the end game for these protocols, it's the inception. So the public market trading comes very, very early on in a digital asset life cycle. And the projects, you know, and founders of projects specifically want the valuation to be extremely underpriced um, because they want their participants to have the opportunity to come in, purchase that asset and interact with the protocol and, you know, kind of grow with the usage and adoption of it, um, you know, as opposed to just being passive investors that kind of buy and, and hope that, you know, the company continues to deliver earnings into the future. Um, so that structural difference makes, you know, pr- makes the pricing of the asset very difficult from a market maker perspective and also from a project perspective. So if you're a project and you know that you need a market maker to provide liquidity 
in your asset. Otherwise, your entire token economic flow is going to break down. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know that the um, you know the the call options, for example, you assign alongside or pair with the loan could become worth substantially more than um, you know than you even expect. You're in this weird situation where you know you want to hire a market maker, but you don't want to end up um, you know a year down the line having written extremely cheap call options and kind of lose a lot of the value that could have come back you know kind of to the protocol um, if that if those assets were retained within treasury so these are some of the challenges i would say that you don't have in in tradfi yeah very much agree with that and you know i don't know any actually specific examples of kind of horror stories in that uh option you know just basically mispricing the option from the project side i don't know do you know any public examples of ones that have kind of been a horror story where they've just given away so much as a result of some kind of pop or something? Yeah, um, you know, I think public examples are hard because a lot of these deals are tied up in, you know, really strict confidentiality agreements. I think, you know, if you ask founders, you know, of large projects, you know, more general question and you say, you know, hey, are you, um, do you feel good about, you know, the, the loan and option series you made when you initially took this asset to market. I think that you'll find a lot of them have deep regret in, um, you know, how the options were priced. And I think you have to realize that, you know, a lot of projects are technologists, you know, they're not um, options traders. And so this is an area where you just kind of have information asymmetry and you've got options traders you know, um, selling these teams on uh, on the structure and, and kind of taking advantage of that. And um, and this is where I believe, uh, you know, market makers in part have developed a really negative perception in the industry um, due to these type of practices. Yeah, as I know, you know, we put together this public resource, just DowDeals.FYI, that grabs a bunch of these public deals from forums and... I saw that them just, yeah. just as an easy database for a team who's thinking about this to just scroll through and understand the average terms. And I will omit the market maker, but there was one specific one that always sticks with me where someone in this token community did understand options really well. They'd previously been an <laughs> option market maker and they had just really quantified for the team, like how much value they were potentially giving away pre uh, pre exchange listings, pre all of this stuff that, you know, generally speaking, can lead to an increase in price. Um, I don't actually know how that one kind of resolved itself, uh, but they did move forward with the agreement. So I agree. It's a lot of technologists versus uh, sharks. So, you know, it doesn't always end well for the token teams there. Yeah, well, you highlighted something really important. Um, you know, you mentioned that there, there was someone in the community that had experienced pricing options and they went through the exercise of actually pricing out those options under several scenarios and told the team what they thought it was worth. And I think that's totally fair game. If you understand the value that, you know, you're potentially, um, you know, giving in exchange for having deep liquidity provision, then, you know, that's a fair exchange. If you don't have any understanding of that value, though, and you've been hoodwinked, um, then I think that that's where the problem arises. Makes sense. So uh, I'd like to go a lot deeper on that, but maybe just as a quick step back, uh, would love to learn a little bit more about you and the firm. Uh, so I think you've been in crypto since 2015-ish, maybe a little bit earlier, 2014. Would love to learn about your initial entrance into the industry and um, what eventually led you to start Ashron. Yeah, uh, so it, it's actually a bit earlier. So I first stumbled upon uh, Bitcoin when I was a teaching assistant at the School of Accounting at uh, Florida Atlantic. And so that was uh, November 2013, uh, kind of like before the, the run up on Mt. Gox and subsequent collapse. And so that's when I started kind of dabbling in the industry. And, um, and it was at that time I decided I really wanted to... Um, you know, I had just completed an internship uh, where I was uh, with PricewaterhouseCoopers and I was on site at uh, Freddie Mac in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. 
And my job for the entire internship was doing loan confirmations where I would call a bank and have them confirm that they had a certain loan balance, um, you know, on their records. And when I started learning about Bitcoin, I realized that, you know, someday in the not too distant future, everything that I just spent, you know, my entire summer doing could be made completely redundant. Like, um, I shouldn't be like, no one's going to send a fax and no one's going to call, you know, some banker to confirm a balance if everything is kind of um, on a, a fully public um, decentralized ledger. And so I started thinking about that as a financial application with a broader scope. And I started looking at my career in general as a CPA or, uh, you know, I was about to become a CPA. And I thought, wow, it looks like this entire industry is going to become more of a, a technology solution and less of a human capital one. And so I better pay attention to this technology and, um, you know, not find myself without a job in 10 years. And, um, you know, it's taking a little bit longer than that, uh, you know, but, um, but anyway, I, um, I decided to spend some of my student loan money to uh, build a mining rig, which is just a gaming computer with a few extra GPUs on it, uh, which is pretty simple to do. And um, that's how I got kind of hands on. And I chalked that up to an educational expense, which is what student loans were for, in my view. And, um, and then I really got interested in, you know, kind of the trading component a couple years later when um, Prime Minister Modi demonetized the 500,000 rupee notes. That was a time where Bitcoin was pretty, um, you know, wasn't very volatile for that brief period of time, but it was trading at a 35% premium on the Indian based exchanges. And so I deposited what little Bitcoin I had on some, you know, Indian exchange, um, you know, sold it for rupees and, you know, sat on it for a few weeks until the price converged, you know, uh, bought back Bitcoin and then withdrew it back, you know, with a, uh, with, you know, obviously pro pocketing a nice Delta. And um, I thought to myself that this is kind of crazy that, you know, just some random retail end user could come in and, and execute like, you um, arbitrage like that. And um, that's really where I, I decided that, you know, this was like a really interesting market, interesting technology, and worth, you know, really exploring different avenues to um, get involved. I have to say that is a new origin story. Obviously, everyone's heard about uh, Korean premiums, Japanese premiums, but uh, the Indian one, I, I did not know. Of. And what time frame was that like 2017 ish? 2015. <laughs> Oh, 2015 in India. Okay, got it. And so it was a couple of years later then that you started uh, Ashram, correct? Right. So what was the uh, origin story there and why did you decide to start the firm? Um, uh, sorry, that was actually, that was actually 20, 2016, November 2016. Um, mm -hmm. That was the, the demonetization period. Um, but, but yeah, so, um, you know, as before Asheron, I, I went to... Um, I went to work at a small digital asset hedge fund called Enigma Capital. And we were, um, you know, it was called Enigma Capital Deciphering Value. Um, my, uh, my buddy and I were um, both from Price Waterhouse. He was a CFA. I was a CPA. And we started, you know, publishing, you know, sell-side research um, and, and white papers on different, uh, different crypto assets. And really trying to, um, you know, take traditional financial valuation techniques and apply them to crypto. And some of that research, you know, got picked up. It garnered interest. It landed us an opportunity to uh, work at this small fund that was, you know, being spun up. Um, and, uh, and, and at that fund, uh, I was decided that or it was decided that I would be the head of trading since I was the one that had kind of been, you know, touching these assets the longest, I was the least likely to lose uh, custody of the capital, you know, interfacing between our wallets and exchanges. And so, you know, the, the fund was investing in, you know, different um, SAFTs at the time, you know, this is like in the 2017 era. And, um, 
And so I was sitting at the desk, you know, logged into these different exchanges when things were going from SAF to public market trading or going through their crypto IPO equivalent. And I noticed that there was a total lack of liquidity to coincide with the primary listing, which is something that would just structurally never happen in uh, traditional markets. And it was happening in every single asset we had coming to market. There's no liquidity. And then eventually some semblance of liquidity would uh, would either turn on or, or, or not. Some of these assets would just collapse, right? And um, so... I did what I think any like prudent investor would do at the time. And I reached out and I tried to, to um, connect with market makers. And my goal was, you know, just to find a good market maker that I could connect our portfolio companies with kind of as a value add, as an investor, as a self-interested investor, right? Um, what I found was deeply concerning. I felt like I was talking to these like extremely shady operators. Like I actually had a, um, you know, Hit BTC was a big exchange back then, and their recommended market maker said, um, yeah, no problem. In response to my first email, they said, no problem, send X amount of Bitcoin. It was like $500,000 worth of Bitcoin and a matching amount of your tokens to these addresses, and we'll take care of the rest. And I was like, what is going on? Like, I, I thought I was going to be interfacing with some form of like financial professional. I mean, this is like a big component for a market and um, it was so frothy and, and insane. Um, I kind of brought this back to the other partners at the fund and I said, Hey, let's um, I think, you know, we should develop something, you know, very rudimentary. Uh, we already have the inventory in these assets on our balance sheet where, you know, they're going to market. If we provide some rudimentary form of liquidity to coincide with the listing, we'll have better investment outcomes. And long story short, they didn't want to allocate the resources. I took it upon myself to prove that this, you know, could be a valuable endeavor. Started the company out of my own pocket and um, eventually left the fund to work on this full time. Amazing. Uh, a very... Uh sort of straight origin story there. And actually, I, I remember HitBTC as well. I haven't thought of that name in a long time. Uh, and I actually think I've probably interacted with the same recommended market maker. I don't remember their name off the top of my head, though. Let's check that out after. Uh, so uh, one other question on Asheron then is, so kind of the founding insight then is that there's all these tokens coming to market. They don't have proper liquidity. And you know, either from a self-interested perspective because you're an investor or just a, you know, broader perspective, there's an opportunity to be a good player providing liquidity. Has that thesis remained pretty consistent over the life of the firm? And maybe where have you had to change, update, as, you know, what's kind of changed over time? Uh, no, that, I mean, that's kind of been like a North Star for us. Um, you know, there, there was a, a, a massive gap in the market. Um, you know, I think, you know, philosophically today, there's still um, a big gap between the way that we view the world and, and other market makers, you know, view the world. And, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of room for uh, market making in crypto to become, you know, a lot more professional, um, certainly a lot more transparent and, um, and, and orderly. Um, there's, you know, really... Um, you know, there's not a lot of published standards by, ex by the major exchanges. And um, so these are all huge areas for improvement. Um, and, you know, that's really where, you know, we're, we're working on spearheading that effort, um, you know, kind of coming off of the back of, you know, the, the collapse of Alameda and, um, you know, a lot of other major institutions in the market, um, you know, you there was this really sour taste left in, in people's mouths. You know, people view market makers as, you know, predatory, risky, opaque, um, all of these things. And, and I, I believe that to be true. I mean, that's, um, that's, you know, kind of the standard that has been set for um, our sector. And so um, if you notice, you know, with our firm, there's a huge push for transparency. 
And so we're making our liquidity KPIs or we make our liquidity KPIs available to the digital asset issuers that we work with in real time. Um, so they get a login and they can, you know, pop in and they can see exactly how much liquidity we're providing, where we're, we're pr providing it, what uptime we have, uh, what fill volume we have and how that looks, you know, in terms of liquidity and volume relative to the rest of the market. And, you know, this just isn't something being done today. I think it's something that, um, you know, projects should demand if I'm being, you know, candid and, um, and not settle for anything less. So, um, you know, we believe by kind of being the uh, by, kind of by spearheading this level of transparency, uh, the rest of the market will pick up on that and, and eventually everyone will start doing it. So that's kind of a perfect segue to the next section I want to cover, which is, so I reached out following an article that, excuse me, that you, uh, or that was in DL News that quoted you pretty extensively calling for more transparency in market making. And in the article, uh, it talks about some of the negative perceptions currently uh, around market making in crypto as a result of kind of the perverse incentives that exist. And as you mentioned, some of the very large public blowups of the past year. To kind of dive into that, um, actually just, you know, going off of something you had just said, is part of the issue just that in crypto, market makers maybe often blend what is a market making strategy and a proprietary trading strategy in some cases, where if you compare that to a firm like Citadel, my understanding is that they have a market making side of the house and a hedge fund side of the house. And I presume there's a pretty clear firewall between those two groups. Is that maybe a place where some of this conflict comes from, from, just blending these different approaches to making money, essentially? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I mean, first of all, that, that article was, um, yeah, I, I read that article, you know, the other morning when it came out and um, I was like reading the headline it was like oh you know one market maker is calling for transparency i'm like oh who who is this and then i and then i saw and then i saw our name quoted i was like really i was surprised um i did an interview with tim you know not too long ago and then um to see that piece you know was really validating that um you know this message is resonating with the market so um you know i, I was really happy about that and um Yes, you know, one thing you just kind of pinpointed was um, coupling investment with market making or commingling investment with market making. And one of the tactics, you know, that's been employed by, you know, a lot of market makers is to invest in the early round of the project and then um, almost blackmail uh, either contractually or kind of, um, you know, in an unsaid way that that investment also needs to come with them signing a market making contract. And, and that market making contract is, you know, they're, they're really pressured into taking it. And I think that that's a really disingenuous way of making an investment. Um, depending on the type of market making contract or structure, I think it could have a, a really clear conflict of interest that, you know, needs to be, um, you know, disclosed with that issuer and they need to be able to accept that or not. Um, but, you know, if you're investing in an asset, um, you know, you're, you're in this for yourself, right? And if you're a market maker, and the project is either compensating you to provide liquidity directly, or they're compensating you via allocating you, you know, a loan and an and option series. Um, you know, you're providing a service to some degree, and um, you know that service, you know, certainly doesn't always line up with you know an investment mandate. And so I think the the commingling of these has is is pretty scammy. Um, and, and it's a way to strong arm projects into doing deals they otherwise wouldn't. And, and I don't really, that doesn't resonate with me at all. I understand that. Yeah. I think that the, the kind of blending there is definitely one of the challenges. So back to the, the DL news article, um, and maybe this is kind of related to what we just talked about, but you said that market makers can get perceived as being predatory 
and that sometimes they engage in strategies that are actually parasitic to the teams where they maybe will uh, prioritize their own profit over what's best for the token at any given point. Could you provide some examples of how that actually happens in practice and maybe what token projects should be aware of? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, I, I can say for certain that market makers act in a predatory and parasitic manner, particularly when it comes to, um, you know, helping to facilitate price discovery in new digital asset issuances. And the way that they do this is, um, you know, we actually have a lot of research that we published on this topic in particular, because it's very important. And I think all digital asset issuers should understand how new assets go through price discovery and the role the market maker plays in either supporting orderly price discovery or creating, you know, artificially inflated prices that then, um, you know, do not enable orderly price discovery and can create irreparable harm to their project and their community members. And so when a new asset comes to market on exchanges, there's a period called um, pre-market order book submission. And this is where market makers can supply liquidity in, um, in, in limit orders to that order book before that order book is exposed for public trading. And the purpose of this is so that when that market becomes available and a user presses the market buy button, they're not going to accept a massive degree of slippage. And so this is, if we, if we rewind back to some of the initial conversation about the differences in market makers for TradFi and crypto, um, the market makers do need to be sourcing inventory from issuers ahead of the listing. And then they actually need to be taking that inventory ahead of the listing being available to the public, placing it on the exchanges that are going to be supporting the primary listing and making sure that that the degree of liquidity that they're placing at various price levels is in line with the amount of demand they expect to come into that asset upon the listing. And what happens is that instead of, you know, placing adequate liquidity for the market to interface with and go through orderly price discovery, they'll actually undersupply the order book, especially on, you know, assets that are very, you know, very hyped, very, um, you know, hot markets. Um, they, they won't have any incentive to actually place liquidity at the opening price and onwards, and they'll actually let the market open totally undersupplied. What happens then is the market goes through your typical pump and dump type of, um, you know, playbook where it'll trade at an extremely high art or artificially high valuation. You know, retail will kind of get in a frenzy. They really don't know what the assets should trade at. They'll start placing limit orders on the book. They'll start, you know, placing market orders with a high degree of slippage at a high price. The market maker will then come in and start. Um, then they'll take their liquidity and they'll start selling and they'll start placing, you know, a, a huge order book skew, a lot of a lot of orders on the offer. And they'll start taking that retail liquidity that's on the bid at those high prices. And they kind of catalyze, they, they first and foremost allow the asset to trade in an unmitigated way to an inflated price. And then they catalyze the decline of the asset by then taking all those retail orders um, with their massive slug of inventory that they have access to. And this is where you have the highest degree of abuse and it's on that listing day. Yeah. So do you, I guess maybe in the area where I, I, I question this is, is this something that you think is kind of broadly prevalent across, let me take this another way. What percentage of projects slash market makers, new listings, do you think this is impacting, right? Is this something that you're seeing widely across the biggest token listings? Is this something that you're seeing more on smaller listings? Like how prevalent is this, I guess, would be my question. I would say it's extremely pervasive. And I would say on your small cap assets, they don't have the resources to hire a competent market maker 
to ensure and, and to help facilitate orderly price discovery. Um, and then on your large, um, large issuances, you know, they're engaging with market makers that don't have any degree of transparency, or they might be providing, you know, liquidity that's, um, you know, retroactive reporting and, and what have you. And mm -hmm. everything that, you know, the, the dynamic that I'm describing happens in almost every single major token launch. Look at the chart and look at, you know, the all time high on the primary listing exchanges, look at that candle and then look at, look at it relative to where it trades 24 to 48 hours later. And there's a massive, massive disparity. Why is that? It's because the market maker undercapitalized the asset for the launch so that they could short it and sell and essentially dump on retail at inflated prices and profit for themselves. Um, this happens pervasively and there's no accountability or reporting. And, you know, that's why the push for transparency is so important because, you know, what happens to you as an end user, if you just got introduced to crypto, right? You have no idea what valuation these things should be trading at. You know, it's going to list on XYZ exchange. You log in there and, you know, you take a thousand dollars and you press the market buy button and you pay for an asset that's 200,000 X above the listing price, right? You're going to lose everything. And how is your experience going to be? You never even got the chance to interact with the protocol. Um, you're not a long-term stakeholder in the ecosystem. You logged in and you got burned, right? So now you hate the project. You hate the market maker. You probably hate crypto. And so this really isn't a productive way for this industry to, to move forward. And it's something that, you know, we're pushing very aggressively against with the research and, you know, with the transparency initiatives. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pulling up your blog right now and uh, I forget the name of the post, but you guys have been doing these quarterly posts on kind of like first day listings and kind of tokens generally across the different exchanges. Uh, can you correct me in terms of like what you've been calling those reports so people can find them and then also some of the findings in terms of these new listings? Yeah, absolutely. So we do have a thought leadership section of our blog um, and we analyze, um, you know, primary listing performance across major centralized and decentralized exchanges. And really the goal for that is to decipher, you know, where true price discovery is taking place for new issuances what that looks like in terms of a, you know, kind of macro indicator for crypto that, you know, you can look at, um, you know, obviously the, the, higher the higher degree of demand that you see for your crypto IPO equivalent is, is reflective of the, the broader macro conditions for the market. Um, but also to help, you know, issuers decide back to one of your first questions, should they be paying listing fees and listing on all these long tail exchanges? Well, you can take a look at the blog and you can see where that exchange ranks, if it's even ranked or not by us. And if it's super low value, well, then you probably shouldn't be allocating a material portion of your treasury to that venue. Huh. And just kind of looking through this list, obviously, there's all the big exchanges on there. There's actually some, uh, some smaller ones that are good to know that they have some liquidity as well. And then, of course, you guys cover all of the major dexes too. So yeah, th these are really interesting to read through. And I think this uh, whole piece around kind of different places to list and, and this, what may be a kind of engineered uh, mispricing around listings is something great for teams to be aware of. The other thing that we've talked for, about a few for times- this one, um, yeah. For this one, Ryan, you know, yeah. the mispr mispricing or undercapitalization or even overcapitalization for a primary listing uh, we did a case study on this. It's called um, Case Study Chain Flip Demystifying Effective Pre Market Order Book Structuring. And this is, if there was one article I would encourage you know, projects to read, it would be this one. Great. We'll make sure to include that in our show notes as well. Something else we've talked about a few times and would be great to actually just go into a little bit more detail with practical advice is how the loan and call option models tend to work. I know you guys have also written a post about reshaping that 
Um, but let's get really into the details of what type of options these tend to be, how long these loans tend to be, and where teams can maybe improve or just be smarter about interacting with market makers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, if you look at that, if you look at that blog post, there's actually a table um, where we talk about reshaping the loan and call option strategy. And that table has kind of a lot of factors that projects can look at and kind of leverage to, um, you know, equip themselves with the, the best ability to advocate, advocate um, the best deal for themselves. Uh, but, you know, what I've seen really recently is um, I've seen a lot of like scammy structuring in loan and call options. So I've seen uh, where, um, you know, market makers will pitch um, all of the options at a premium. And I've even seen proposals where there's like these, um, uh, you know, they'll have strikes at a, at a high price at consecutively higher prices. And they'll even chart it up out like a like a chart going up. So from the project's perspective, they see that and they think, oh, wow, you know, uh, my market maker is kind of aligned with me in, in having like a positive trajectory for my asset growth. And, you know, in reality, the, a lot of the market makers don't actually care about the option series at all. They care about maximizing the quantity of tokens that they're going to be loaned, again, because they're exec executing this pervasive parasitic strategy upon the market open where they're going to wait for the asset to trade at an extremely high price. They're going to take that inventory that they have a monopolistic holding of at inception, and they're going to sell that onto retail. And so they don't really care about this option series at that point. It's really just a risk mitigator in the instance that they get it wrong and this asset still continues to trade in a par parabolic manner. Um, that's a risk mitigator. And so I think projects need to see past these gimmicky financial structures. And I think they need to ask the hard questions. So hard question being, how are you going to structure the opening order book for initial price discovery? How are you going to help facilitate orderly price discovery of this asset in the highest demand day for it? Um, not after it lists, before the market is actually even open to the public. How are you structuring that? Um, that's, and then the second question to that is how does that strategy and that structuring of that opening order book relate back to how you've structured this loan and option series, right? And for example, if all of your strikes are at these ridiculously inflated prices, like that looks good, but you're not gonna have any appetite to quote on the opening order book Otherwise, you're immediately um, in a bad situation as a market maker. Um, you just immediately will have a realized loss when the asset opens higher, uh, if you were. So these are the type of questions that I would be asking and really want to understand. Um, you know, because, again, if, there's, if the market maker isn't incentivized to provide liquidity on the open, you're not going to have orderly price discovery. And this is what a market maker is tasked to do. They're supposed to provide liquidity on the open. And the open is the most important day for the asset. Um, it is an IPO equivalent. So that's what I would want to know. Um, the second is what type of reporting are you going to provide? What type of accountability is there? Um, if you're just providing retroactive reporting, I have no idea what you did throughout the day or, or, or week or month before then, right? And, and I have no granularity. So, um, you know, first of all, is how does this, how does the proposal and structure relate to supporting orderly price discovery? And then second, what assurances do I have that you actually did what you said you're going to do? Yeah. And I guess on the reporting piece, um, what kind of, so let's say I'm working with a market maker, market maker does not provide first day liquidity equivalent to anything that I thought. We do have this pop, we do have this crash, now we have this angry community. What kind of recourse do I even have with the market maker in that case? Are these agreements generally easy to terminate and you know get back the loaned amount? I imagine you're also in the challenge now as a token project because you have to find a new market maker or the exchanges are gonna uh, start calling you. Like, What does that process look like of unwinding early one of these agreements? 
Yeah, it's typically it's it's typically like a, a huge pressure point for projects. You know, they're very scared. Um, you know, they they view the market maker um, almost as an enemy at that point, and an enemy that has a significant degree of control over you know basically everything that they've been building. Um, you know, they they're scared to confront the market maker, and I think this is like this is like a huge problem where they view if they even bring up that they think the market maker, you know, has contributed to, um, you know, negative outcomes uh, for their project that the market maker, you know, may do something to make the situation even worse. And, you know, what I found, you know, I was actually on a panel recently with other market makers and they were describing that, um, you know, a lot of issuers have reached out to them and been afraid of the market maker dumping tokens at the end of the loan term. And um, I thought that was pretty funny because projects um, should actually not be afraid of that. In most instances, they should be looking at the market maker actually closing their short position by buying the token when they terminate the contract. So in reality, if you're working with a parasitic market maker that has shorted your asset and contributed to a perpetuous uh, decline in your asset, then terminating that contract, having them, you know, they're not going to exercise the options. They're going to buy back the token at the cheaper price. And that's really the best way to get rid of them and kind of remove that, um, you know, negative. Um, overhang in the project, you know, find a market maker that's going to to be honest and transparent and then, you know, support unadulterated price discovery in the asset. So in terms of even closing the loan out at the end by selling or buying the asset, these options, though, generally tend to be American options as uh, opposed to European options, which, you know, I believe means that the loan or the uh, option could be exercised at any time during the duration. And I think these are generally one year. So do you find that it's common? I, 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 let me let me put on my hat as if I was the worst actor possible as a market maker, right? I would try to engineer the first day pump or whatever we're going to call it. I would exercise the options, possibly, sell into this kind of unwind that you've talked about. And now I'm just, you know, I've kind of, already profited on this thing and now I just have to kind of finish out the loan term or do you see that happening or, or I guess what would be the worst thing that a market maker could do in this case if they were trying to abuse the option structure? Yeah. So, you know, typically, typically the market makers, you know, aren't going to exercise early, even in, hmm. you know, even if it's, you know, an American option, I mean, it, that just, there's not really any sense in doing that. They have no motivation to exercise early. Um, they're going to sit on it as long as possible. What they may do is look to restrike. So uh, what you might do, um, you know, what a parasitic market maker, you know, would do is they would, you know, let's just say they have one tranche of, of loan tokens and then they've got, you know, a, um, you know, a, a, and, and, and then, and then they want to exercise the, that loan. So the, to the price, the token opens up, they sit on the sidelines. They wait for a frenzy to occur on low liquidity, in a low liquidity environment. Um, they create that artificial scarcity in the order book that helps the asset trade trade at a very high price. They liquidate into it, and then you know they may look to, um, you know, they may have set you know that those strikes with some you know premium to them or what have you. They may exercise and look to refresh that loan or restrike at a lower price um, or, or at the new price, get access to more inventory. Now you've got a situation where, you know, the emission curve starts to play out, more tokens become available. Now they've got an opportunity to short the token again and help perpetuate a second wave of decline in the asset. And, um, you know, that's really where you know, you can see that happening. And, and a lot of the, a lot of the ter terms will actually be, um, you know, they'll, they'll kind of, they'll kind of market the short duration, like restrikes like oh, we'll do monthly or, or quarterly restrikes, 
you know, that's marketed it as some somehow favorable to the project. Like, um, oh yeah, you know, we'll we'll restrike the loan and um, you know, pay you uh, you know, on the uh, you know, on the exercise price and that'll put more, you know, money into, you know, your company and so on and so forth. Um, you know, really they're just looking to have another profitable short opportunity and get more inventory. Yeah, two two other examples that you had mentioned, I think, in the DL news piece were uh, Pith and WLD Worldcoin of token launches where market makers uh, profit incentives perhaps outweighed orderly price discovery. As a kind of quick case study, could you maybe walk through what happened in those two cases, and um, I guess anything documented you saw that led to this not orderly price discovery? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that was the reporter referencing some of our public research. Mm -hmm. And one of our clients gave us permission to uh, talk about their launch and, um, you know, the the pre-market order book structuring, which is is so critical in relation to other, you know, major, you know, high profile launches at the time. And um, so that was a really good opportunity for us to, um, you know, kind of demonstrate the differences in, um, you know, launch style. So a a parasitic type launch and a, um, you know, a symbiotic launch, you know, where adequate liquidity was supplied. It wasn't oversupplied. It wasn't undersupplied. Right. And you can take a look at um, the performance. So the initial, um, if you look at the charts for those assets and you look at the market open. So the first candle you'll see that there's a very, very high, all-time high set in um, in Pith and World relative to Flip and uh, mm-hmm. or relative to where they traded, you know, 24 to 48 hours later. And what that tells you, so the degree of magnitude between that all-time high and where it's trading the next day can kind of tell you just how undersupplied, it's a measurable way to see how undersupplied that opening order book was because there are people purchasing that asset at an inflated price. Certainly if it trades at, you know, $10 on the listing day and a dollar the next day, something broke down in that process, um, especially if that's happening in a pervasive fashion. So this is just one instance of us, um, you know, kind of uh, putting a concrete and measurable way of looking at an orderly launch versus an, a, a disorderly or, or totally undercapitalized launch. Got it. So as we're coming to the end here, we've spent a lot of time talking about uh, bad behaviors of market makers. At the same time, your firm is uh, a market maker. So I would love to learn what it is about the Asheron approach that differs from the bad behaviors that you see in the market and how you're trying to remedy some of these issues. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to position Asheron as, you know, an altruistic firm. Um, you know, we've seen that done in the past and, uh, we've seen how that turned out. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know, Asheron is a pragmatic firm. So, you know, market making, I mean, it has it has two it has two kind of overarching goals. You know, one it's uh, necessary uh, to uh, compensate market makers. It's necessary to work with market makers for your token economy to operate effectively. Um, it's even more important in crypto to have um, you know uh, market makers because the protocol breaks down without them. Whereas in traditional finance, you know, you're really catering just to like investors and it's, a, and it's an, an, ex, uh, an expression of the fair value in the asset through orderly price discovery. This is so that these entire ecosystems can even operate. So on one hand, you know, you're, you're kind of willing to engage with market makers, understanding that there's always going to be an exchange in value. You know, market makers are for-profit enterprises. And, you know, that brings me to, you know, my second, my second point, you know, we don't have altruistic intentions, you know, we are here to make money over the long term. And, but, 
that doesn't need to come at the expense of, um, you know, collapsing these assets or, you know, structure or, or hoodwinking projects and, and not letting them understand exactly what value is being transacted. And so, um, you know, while Asheron, um, you know, you know, Asheron is an extremely profitable company. Uh, we're we're doing that under the lens that you know we're in an industry that itself is growing in a parabolic manner, and you don't need to be a predator or a parasite to do very well. Um, if you do the right things, if you disclose to projects, you know how you're working, what it, what value is being exchanged, you know what you're going to offer on exchanges. You explain how the structures work, and you structure fair compensation. And then you're accountable. You have some degree of accountability, you know, via being transparent and reporting, um, you know, then, you know, you stand to benefit over a longer time horizon. Um, you know, when I started the company um, six years ago, um, I had the same mindset that I do today. Um, you know, we if we do things the right way over the course of many, many years, uh, we're going to be extremely successful. And, um, you know, I didn't leave a cushy job in, in corporate America to pursue this for, you know, a one to two year fling. Um, I, I truly believe that this is transformative to finance. And I think that's been largely validated with the spot ETF approvals. And so this whole thing is maturing. I think it can be a lot bigger than any of the transient type of, you know, market makers have kind of looked at the industry and, and, and govern themselves around. And, um, you know, that's really what we're focused on. We're focused on the big picture over a long time horizon. Love to hear that. Now, within the services offered, I believe you guys offer three different types of market making of how a, a team can work with you, whether that's uh, as a designated market maker or it's other structures. Could you maybe just talk about those quickly so teams uh, kind of have an awareness of those differences? Yeah, I got this question recently, and the question was, you know, hey, Wes, what, what's, what's the better model, a retainer-based service model or, a, um, or, you know, a loan and call option structure? And, you know, the answer is not for, for us to decide as a market maker or any other market maker to decide. It's up to the project to decide what model best suits them at the stage they are in in their life cycle. And that may change over time. And so the way that we've positioned Asheron is to be able to offer um, both, you know, loan and call option through a fully transparent symbiotic um, practice, a retain a, a full custody, you know, market making service model, which we call designated market making for crypto. Um, and third, a technology license. So um, you know, we've got other market makers that actually license our technology to service their clients, uh, which kind of cater to, you know, some of the longer tail um, assets that, you know, we may not have the capacity to work with. Um, projects themselves could even license that technology and operate it for themselves. So I think, you know, it's a question for the project, what is going to best work for them? And that answer may change over time. And you know we're we're there to support them in, in 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 any capacity that suits them best. Yeah, at the very least, I find these alternative models to be extremely interesting. Um, one, by giving teams something to compare and benchmark against, rather than thinking that they're kind of forced into this one structure. Um, and, and two, I mean that's kind of how exploration happens. And if something like the software licensing model winds up being something that's easy enough for teams to spin up themselves. I don't see why they wouldn't do that. You know, we'll have any more control. I, I understand why they wouldn't do that actually today, but perhaps over time that winds up being more of a model. Uh, two last questions to kind of wrap up here. So, you know, in traditional markets, there's obviously regulation around market makers. There's the uh, NBBO, National Best Bid and Offer, which, you know, enforce, is enforced by the SEC so that market makers have to provide the best prices for these assets. In lieu of, regulatory involvement like that in crypto, why don't the exchanges enforce something like this? Or is there someone else that is poised to enforce some self-regulation like this? 
I think there's a um, there there's a very there's a there's a lot a lot for exchanges to do to become more mature. I think there's going to be a um, you know there has been and will continue to be a consolidation of you know cent- of you know centralized exchanges where trading actually takes place. You know not just where um, the 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 illusion of trading takes place. And so I think following that consolidation and also, you know, kind of the maturity and, and industrialization of the asset class in general, you're going to start seeing, you know, more structured frameworks put in place by exchanges. So I do expect that, you know, they will start kind of publishing, you know, the, the market makers that are um, kind of the most active on the platform and, and aren't, you know, violating, you know, um, just, you know, sensible market practices and, and things of this nature. And I think you'll start seeing a lot more criteria be enforced by the exchanges themselves. Um, I just think that we're still, um, you know, I'm constantly uh, reminded, you know, how early we are uh, because a lot of these things don't exist. And, um, and, and so I, I think that's where, I think that's where we're going and I think we'll see it from the exchanges. Well, I hope to see that. That would be uh a great development for the space. And last question to, you know, end our great conversation here is what changes do you anticipate actually happening in the market making landscape over the next one to two years? I know the changes that you would like to see materialize, um, but obviously those will have headwinds as you know, uh, it involves structural change at firms that are maybe out of your control involves, you know, general more awareness, which can be diff- which can be difficult, but what do you expect might actually happen uh, in the near term within the market making space? I think I think it will become I think it will become a lot more competitive. Um, it's already becoming you know more competitive. You know we've seen a lot of um, you know new entrants to market making in general. Um, I think you'll see you know firms that you know we didn't even talk about firms that pretend to call themselves market makers, you know, that are Mm. doing wash trading and, um, you know, spoofing and in all kinds of market manipulate manipulation tactics. I think these firms will largely, you know, disappear. Um, You know, that's my hope. Um, And then I I think, you know, the days of architecting these totally like um, information asymmetrical um, relationships where a market maker is getting, um, you know, just an outsized position in the asset, um, you know, in structures that really just don't make sense or promote the um, the longevity of, of, of the ecosystem. I think these agreements are going to get a lot more competitive. And um, I think a lot of the, the scammy antics, you know, like um, investing in, uh, in the project and, and forcing them to use, use the market maker, um, I think these all of these type of things that happen and abuses that happen in, in an early asset class are, are going to um, kind of get, you know, are, are going to fizzle away by the market. And um, I, I, but my biggest hope is that uh, the transparency, um, I think the transparency and accountability can be a huge cure for a lot of these ailments. And um, so that's really where our focal point is and where we're going to continue pushing the hardest. Well, I look forward to all of that. You know, transparency is great. Uh, And thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. Uh, Is there anything we didn't cover that you would like to share or places you want to point listeners and viewers to? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, we've been putting out a lot of thought leadership, um, you know, starting from market making fundamentals and then talking about pre-market order book structuring and then also on, you know, loan and call option and describing uh, the different areas that they should be looking at and, and thinking about. I would really encourage, you know, any project to spend time on this. I, um, I wouldn't, you know, rely wholly on investors or, you know, quote unquote token advisors to guide you in the right direction. I wouldn't even rely fully on our thought leadership. Um, you know, I, but I would spend time researching uh, market making and how deals are structured. Uh, before 
you know, signing something with a market maker that ultimately you're, you're going to regret down the line um, because you're going to save yourself uh, potentially uh, a lot of, um, a lot of money and, and also a lot of, uh, a lot of headaches uh, by putting in a little work now. So. Well, once again, thank you for tuning in and uh, I hope token teams give this a listen and are able to make more educated decisions as a result. Thanks for your time today.